Welcome to The Myth of Motherhood, a podcast by, for, and about moms and those who love them. I don't believe in TMI, and this is a 100% judgment-free zone, because there is no one right way to be a mother. There is only your right way. I'm your host, Alyssa Alter, a Brooklyn-based mom, women's health expert, and motherhood advocate. Curious to learn more about what I do and why I do it? Visit alyssa-alter.com. All right, let's get this myth-busting party started. Welcome back. Um, I am really excited about today's episode, which I'm also realizing I'm pretty sure I say about every single episode. Um, But that is because I'm excited about these things that I create and put together and the conversations that I have to share with you. And I will let you know that there have been times where I record or I write things and realize that you deserve better than that. Um, And I don't publish them (laughs) because I really, really do value and appreciate and respect this time that we share together, which goes with today's episode, right? That our words matter. It matters what we say and it really matters what we don't say, right? The words that we choose or don't choose carry weight and are important. And this is something that came up in um, the recent episode. I believe it's episode 71. Yes. Uh, When you need... You don't need to be a mom to need your mom with Dana Black, Um, right? And how I come from a family where a lot of things remain unsaid, and there's a lot of power in that. And about, I've talked in previous episodes, and I write about how not speaking up about how I felt and what I was experiencing in my first marriage led to years of suffering, in silence. There was a lot of power and weight to the things I wasn't saying. I shared in um, all over the place on the blog, um, uh, in Instagram reel that was really popular um, early on in my first trimester about what freaking trash I felt like. Because after my divorce, when I was suffering in silence for so long, I vowed to myself, I will never suffer in silence again. And now I suffer out loud. And I recently started exploring (laughs) Pinterest, um, which I know this seems like this doesn't make any sense. Why is she now talking about Pinterest? But as always, there is a method to the madness. Stick with me. I... You know, I'm active on Instagram um, and I enjoy posting. I enjoy making videos like I'm a, you know, I'm a performer. I love that stuff. I like creating things. Um, And I also go back and forth with how I feel about, you know, this, this, this feeling that I, you know, some of it comes from inside me. Some of it is external pressure that I like need to be on social media all the time. And like, for what? And my goal isn't to be an influencer. And I, uh, that is not with judgment of people who are influencers. We all do our own things, but then sometimes I'm like, Oh my God, am I turning into an influencer? Is that what this is? Do I want to be an influencer? I don't want to be an influencer, but is that what, what is happening? Um, and so I, I had some conversations with people who know more than me or <laughs> know different things than me. Um, and in terms of supporting my work, supporting my business, supporting the content that I create that I'm really proud of, uh, it made sense to start exploring posting on Pinterest that, you know, it sort of blew my mind that um, it's a search engine, not social media. And maybe you know this, but this was news to me. Um, And that I know that a lot of moms in particular, but people, you know, utilize Pinterest, right? Like we make Pinterest boards for things. So I'm over there, you know, and I'm like, I'm trying to be as organized as possible about like, okay, I want to utilize this as a way to offer my free resources, my free downloads, promote courses and other offerings that I have, promote 
these podcast episodes, promote blog posts, right? Another way to, like my goal is to share this information. My goal is to help even if it's just one mom, which I know that it, I know that it's more than one mom. I know that it's not just moms. And I know that it's more than one person who, who from me sharing my story, feel seen and feel less alone. And I would love it if we all felt less alone. So, you know, this seems like a great way to reach all the people, right? (laughs) Which is like ultimately my goal that like we come together. So anyway, Anyway, I start in my efforts to be organized. I started a Google Doc where I was like, okay, here are to start out, right? Because over the past couple of years, I, um, I've created a lot of content, created a lot of things. So I was like, okay, what do I want to start with? Like the things that I want to share about first, um, you know, and so I made a list like my free download, um, the 20 things no one tells you about pregnancy and postpartum, my other ebook, three things you deserve to know about your vag, um, the five day pelvic floor mini course, um, your owner's manual. Uh, so I like, you know, I wrote these things in a Google doc and I, and I wrote like different, what could be titles for an image and little blurbs, you know, to explain what the resource is, um, so that I could post it on Pinterest and, uh, as I've been going, I've also, you know, been going back through the podcast episodes, you know, we've, we've discovered here and maybe you haven't listened to all of them, in which case, like, why aren't you clicking follow and subscribe right now? And after this episode, go binge them, um, and share with a friend, but, uh, <laughs> you know, to promote them, especially as I am getting ready to have another baby, I am preparing for another different postpartum <laughs> experience And I'm going back through past podcast episodes, through past blog posts to see what I said to help set me up for success, (laughs) because I think I've said some pretty great things. And everything that I've created, I've created out of like looking for this resource and not being able to find it. So I made it or I wanted to hear from someone about a certain topic and I couldn't find it. So I talked about it. So I... W- decided to create some graphics and share about episode 48 of this podcast called I'm a mom, but I'm not your mom marriage after baby. Because part of my preparing for a second baby is preparing Jeremy and I preparing our marriage because both of our attention is going to be split even further. I'm going to be pretty consumed with recovery and figuring out how to feed a new baby and manage all these things, that it could be very easy for us to be further and further and further apart. And then like, I don't know, continue drifting apart. And I don't want that. I really like Jeremy. I really like him. And I, I love him. In fact, if you didn't realize that, um, and I want this to, I want this to be something we experience as much as possible within something that is inherently insane. So, as I was sharing about I'm a mom and I'm but I'm not your mom and thinking about why do I want to share this resource? Why do I think this is valuable? Why would someone want to like click on that and listen to the episode or read the article? I started thinking, seeing more and more. And as I was like listening to the episode that I created, I realized that it relates to this week's episode, which is that the words that we use and how we use them make a huge difference. And I actually talked about pieces of this and expanded on it a bit in a in my newest article that was published for Robin, which if you don't know about Robin, they are a phenomenal resource for your parenthood journey from trying to conceive infertility, fertility, pregnancy, postpartum, Um, they're an incredible platform and I wrote, I published an article for them about navigating sex in parenthood and some of the communication things that I talk about in it relate to this about what we're saying and what we do really matters. And I also want to share just because I'm, I'm really excited. This article feels especially special to me, um, and exciting because 
I have written for Robin before. And in most in, in most situations, I pitch myself. I reach out and I'm like, I love your platform. And, you know, I would, I'm an expert in this. And I was thinking, uh, this type of article would be really supportive to your community. I also have this idea, you know, a, a, if you know how to pitch, like, you know, pitching them, like some ideas of what I think would be great in order to publish with them. But this time they reached out to me to write for them, which I felt really good. So like, thanks for taking a moment to celebrate that with me and check out the article. It's linked in the show notes. And if you feel so inspired, if you have a friend um, who might be interested in that or who might benefit from reading that, um, feel free to share it with them. Um, but anyway, the reason I talked about both of those, besides that they're great resources that you should check out or could check out, is that um, it's about this explicit communication, right? That the words that we're using or not using really matter. And Jeremy and I have been having more and more conversations as we prepare to bring home another baby. And I just keep thinking more and more about how our words matter and how much they've mattered in the past. Uh, When Jeremy and I were planning our wedding and the wedding ceremony, which obviously I co-wrote with my BFF and creative partner, Beth Slack, who also officiated our wedding, um, and how very specific I was... In our vow, that our vows use the word choose. I choose you to be my husband. I choose you to be my wife. Because I was always very explicit with Jeremy during the dating and engagement and always process that I don't need him. I'm choosing him. And that in our marriage every day, we are choosing to be here. And yes, there are ways in which we have both grown to need each other. I need, I do need him. And at the same time, I know that I am strong enough to be on my own. I am strong enough to trust myself. And I choose not to do this alone. I choose to do all of this with him just as I chose just as much as I chose not to do any of this with my ex-husband, I chose to leave that marriage and I choose, I chose and continue to choose a different life for myself. And I won't go on that tangent because one, that's not the topic of today's uh, episode is not my first marriage. We can talk about that another time. And two, I've talked about it before, so we can talk about it another time. So today is about how the words we choose, see what I did there? matter. Now, something you may not know about me is that in addition to my dance performance and choreography major at Skidmore College, I was also a Spanish language and literature major, which is basically like having an English major just in Spanish. Everything was in Spanish. My The lectures, the papers, the 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 literature, the poems, everything. So yes, I took in and I did, in fact, take an entire course on 19th century Spanish literature and South American poetry um, of the 30s and 40s, all in Spanish. All of it was in Spanish. And yes, 19th century Spanish literature is kind of written like Spanish Shakespeare. So when I didn't understand a word, you also like can't really look it up because it's like not really part of the language. It was it was a doozy. Um, and everything, the classes, the papers, the exams, all of it were in Spanish. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, de veras? Really? See. Si. Yes. Now, I will be honest because that's what I always do. I didn't go to college intending to be a Spanish major. I actually went in intending to be a dance and math double major. But it turns out that me and calculus aren't made for each other. So (laughs) I loved Spanish class. So I sort of ended up I kind of almost ended up with a Spanish major because every semester I took a Spanish class because I loved it. And then I ran out of like the grammar and conversation classes. So I started taking lit classes and then I just kept taking them. And at one point, my one of my professors was like, you literally have to take one more class and you have a major. And I was like, huh, look at that. Um, 
But I loved it. And I think part of the reason is that I actually started learning Spanish in kindergarten. The school that I went to had a teacher named Isabel who came on Wednesdays. Um, and she's from Colombia, which I never forgot because I later became, I'm a big fan of Shakira and she's also from Colombia. And I was like, oh my God, my Spanish teacher's from Colombia. Anyway, um, Isabel came to school on Wednesdays and we'd sing songs, learn the days of the week, months of the year, fruits and vegetables. And eventually read little books and had short conversations. The thing is, while I didn't like graduate eighth grade, like fluent in Spanish, when I got to public high school, I started in Spanish one. Um, but what happened is as a result, Spanish made sense to me, the rhythm of it, the structure of it, the patterns of it, um, made sense in my head. So it, it was easier to learn because I, I just sort of had a deeper understanding of it. So, uh, I guess you could say I developed an ear for it. And I think that also paired with the fact that when I was really little, I went to a preschool at my synagogue and I was always in Hebrew school. Um, I was exposed to yet another language with like a different alphabet. You read it from the other direction. Um, I have basic, I mean, next to no conversational skills in Hebrew, I can say like, where's the bathroom? My name's Alyssa. Uh, I do not speak Hebrew. Um, like I have phrases, but I don't understand it. But again, I think the early exposure opened up my brain to being more open to these different patterns and rhythms and picking up on them. Anyway, I love languages. And while I don't speak French or Italian, I find I can get around without a problem because I understand a lot of like overlapping vocabulary, but again, sort of the rhythm and pattern of the language that since I speak Spanish and have like 35 years of ballet training, I actually know a lot more French than I think I know. And Italian's closer to Spanish, so I can get around pretty well. I actually once took a yoga class in Paris, which I thought was going to be in English. It definitely wasn't. But I realized that between my familiarity with like the Sanskrit terms for yoga poses from my yoga practice paired with ballet, I understood almost the entire yoga class. It absolutely blew my mind. And same thing happened when I took a French spin class. They didn't have the Sanskrit in it, but I understood the directions <laughs> because I understood directions in French. So anyway, okay, this episode isn't about me taking yoga or spin in France or the dance classes I took in Israel, all in Hebrew, or the yoga I took in Bosnia. Anyway, in Bosnia, it's fine. I've traveled and I take fitness when I'm away. This is actually about something very specific that I learned in Spanish from my Spanish major. Um, and when we were learning about this, I think we first learned about this idea, I think in Spanish one, I mean, I think, I mean, I think it was always kind of a thing. And then when I was like really studying Spanish in college, um, it was super confusing. We were all confused because a lot of the like language, I don't even know what the word to, like, there are a lot of things about language that are utilized in in Spanish, in French, in Italian that we just don't use in English, that it's really hard to understand. While there are like verb conjugations that are easier, it, it just, okay, so um, instead of talking around it, I'm going to tell you what it is, okay? In English, we have the phrase to be, Right, the verb, to be, is a verb, right? And to be is a verb that exists in Spanish as well, right? Except it, it exists in two forms. Now, I do have to give a caveat that I'm going to keep this really simple because I'm not a Spanish teacher, right? I didn't even go to college intending to be a Spanish major, let alone become a Spanish teacher. I use my Spanish degree for a podcast episode like this for belting Shakira by myself in the car and whenever I can otherwise, but really like nothing formal. And also because maybe you took another language like Hebrew or German, 
um, where or Greek, where the alphabet is different and verb conjugations function differently and all of that. So anyway, to be or not to be, just kidding, uh, the verb to be. We have that in English. In Spanish, it, the verb to be exists as both ser and estar. Both of these verbs mean to be, but are used in different contexts. Now, when I conjugate the verb estar to be in the like I form, yo estoy, I am talking about a state of being that I am in. Um, yo, something that can, that is maybe more transient. Yo estoy en Nueva Jersey. I am in New Jersey. I could get in the car and drive to New York, right? Yo estoy mal means I'm not, I'm not doing well. I, I don't, I don't, I'm not really, I'm like sort of, I'm like in a bad state right now. Or I could conjugate Let's go with that last one. Like, I'm in a bad state, right? State of being, not state like New Jersey and New York. Did I just make that more confusing? You're welcome. Okay, so if I conjugate the verb ser to the I form, yo soy, if I say yo soy mal, in this context, yo soy is I am bad. Like, yo soy is like I to be, but like who I am. I am a bad, I am an inherently bad person. I have a bad temperament, bad intentions. I am bad. I don't feel bad. I am bad. I'm not in a bad state. I am bad. I could say estoy feliz, meaning I am happy right now, right? I'm in a positive state of mind and I feel happy. Or I can say soy feliz, which communicates that I'm generally a happy person. I have a happy, sunny disposition. That's my temperament. And I'm wired to be more of a positive Patty. And if you're wondering, the answer is yes, that I did play Patty Simcox in my high school's production of Grease. I know you were wondering. So I know I kind of spoke in circles. Again, I'm not a Spanish teacher, but I'm hoping that there is some clarity to this. Both of the verbs mean to be, yet one communicates sort of a current state of being, and the other refers to a deeper inherent state of being. Okay, you're probably like, uh, when does the Spanish lesson end, Alyssa? Because it is rough. Why are we even talking about all of this? And a promise, again, as always, there is a method to the madness, so stick with me because it's it's really a good one. So this is something that happened probably in the summer of like 2021. So not peak COVID, but not not COVID. Everett was about a year and a half old, and we'd all been together every day, all day, for his entire life, minus like the six weeks Jeremy and I went back to work before the world shut down. We'd taken our car to go out for an outing somewhere to feel like humans, and we were driving home. I was driving because I am a terrible backseat driver, <laughs> especially when Jeremy drives in the city, which, to be clear, is 100% a me thing. Jeremy drives perfectly well in and out of the city. This is me. And because we were riding that fine, fine line of cutting it close to nap time on our way home, where, like, if Everett fell asleep in the car, even for, like, 10 seconds, we'd lose the whole nap. And Everett was crying because he was tired. And so my brain and body were like on fire because he was crying and his nap was on the line. So I was capital S stressed. And something that happens when I get stressed is that Jeremy gets stressed. He wants to make me feel better and he does whatever he can do to try to help. But when I'm stressed, I go into super overdrive and I just want to handle things. I don't want to talk. I don't want to hear your opinion. I want you to read my mind, know what I'm thinking and do exactly what I'm thinking and what I would do um, without me having to tell you or communicate that or give directions or admit that I actually might need some help. Is that too really too much for me to ask for? I know. So clearly I'm being really nice and I'm just a general joy to be around at this moment. And understandably, Jeremy becomes frustrated. <clears throat> and in his defense, while this is a stressful situation, my reaction and level of intensity is not necessary here. And the truth 
truth of this, we've talked about this a lot, is that when I get like this, it's because I feel out of control and my anxiety kicks into gear. I become hyper vigilant, so I become controlling. And in these moments, what I need to do, which is not Jeremy's responsibility, yet I do ask for his support in this, is to ask myself what is actually scaring me at this moment. Why do I feel so out of control? Anyway, this isn't an analysis of Alyssa's neuroses right now, although maybe it always is anyway. Okay, the short version is I got triggered, which triggered Jeremy. We both got mad at each other. So since this whole situation now, Everett crying in the back, he needs a nap. We're driving home. There's traffic. It's the city. This whole situation is heightened and we're both being not the nicest. And Jeremy made some sort of comment that I honestly don't remember because I was so busy being so stressed. But what I heard, what I reacted to, I'm being very specific with these words because they reflect my reaction, not necessarily what Jeremy said. Because if you've ever met Jeremy, you know he's incredible and like not capable of being mean. Anyway, what I heard and reacted to was something that was basically the equivalent of be of telling me to calm down and not stress out. Which, if you've ever been stressed and someone tells you not to stress or that it isn't worth stress- stressing about or you're wrong for being stressed about whatever the thing is, you know how infuriating and intensifying of the stress that is, right? So I felt like I was getting in trouble for having what inside my body was a perfectly normal mom response to her child crying and risking falling asleep and everything going to shit sort of situation. Okay, so in my experience at this moment, my reaction to the things he was saying, Jeremy was being a major asshole. And I told him, I was stressed, but now I am pissed because you're being an asshole. Jeremy responds, oh, so now I'm an asshole? No, Jeremy, listen to my words. I am not calling you an asshole because you are not an asshole. That would be the verb ser, right? You are acting like an asshole. I said you are being an asshole. That would be the verb estar. Right? Do we see the ser and a star here? In English, we don't make this distinction. In English, the way we use your being, we'll just say an asshole for right near right now, and you are an asshole is interchangeable. We don't clarify. We do not distinguish. It's not a priority. It's not something we do in our language. And in Spanish, they are distinct. And you can accidentally insult someone very deeply with the incorrect verb choice, right? And while this made for more opportunities for mistakes on tests and in papers, this distinction actually continues to shape how I think about things in my everyday life. I think about this a lot in the way that I speak to Jeremy. I'm very clear. Jeremy is not an asshole. He can act like an asshole, He isn't an asshole. He can be an asshole. I'll tell you what. I'm not an asshole, and I sure as hell can be one giant asshole, okay? I am clear. I am very explicit and conscious about how I use this when I'm speaking to Jeremy, and the same when I'm speaking to Everett. Everett is 100% toddler these days. It is so fun. He's in... This place where he's like part kid and still part baby. And it's so delicious and sweet and super challenging. And he, as he continues to develop more of his personality and individual identity each day, he needs more independence and autonomy. And I don't blame him. He's also still a toddler. So there's a limit on how much independence and autonomy, autonomy he can safely have right? There's a limit to how much responsibility he can handle. And that's my job as his mom, right? To help navigate that and find some sort of balance where he's safe and autonomous. Anyway, he pushes the limits and he's supposed to. And it not always listening well. His behavior is not always behavior that I like or that is allowed in our house. I am very specific about saying you are not allowed to do that because there are certain things. He can throw a stool. He is not allowed 
to throw a stool, right? I'm very clear that he can be mad or sad or or upset, frustrated, angry, et cetera. He is not allowed to throw a stool at me, hit me, scratch me, bite me, right? Or hurt or animals, not people or animals. (laughs) He certainly can do these things. He is able. He is not allowed. There are times that he is a bad listener. He is being, he is, that he está a bad listener, right? The verb estar. He is not inherently a bad listener. So I'm clear that he isn't listening well in this moment. He seems to be having trouble, but I know that he is is a good listener, even though we're having a hard time with that right now. I want him to know that he is loved no matter what. He is good no matter what. And his behavior is not always a reflection of who he is. Good people make bad choices. This also shows up when I work with clients. I worked in Pilates studios for, what, 15 years? More? I mean, technically I still do, although I'm more of an independent contractor these days. Anyway, in this, in, when I'm living the life where I'm teaching in a studio, where I'm teaching seven or eight people in a row, day after day, alongside other che- teachers working in the same way. So I'm saying this in that, like, not only did I teach a ton of human beings, I had a front row seat to teaching and hearing many other, seeing and hearing many other teachers and clients exchanging information and what these dynamics look like. I also myself have taken thousands upon thousands of lessons and classes in dance, in Pilates, in yoga, and other more and other modalities as a student. And something I have seen repeatedly and experienced personally, repeatedly, is correction that feels like criticism. Okay, and if you've ever been in a romantic relationship or like had a parent, especially maybe during your adolescence, you know exactly what I mean, right? So this isn't just between like a teacher and a student. This is in all of our relationships, right? I've experienced getting corrections on my form, on my movement, on my body, on choreography that is teeming with subtext that says, how could you have made a mistake like this, you fucking idiot? You're doing this all wrong. And I've already talked about this. You're doing it wrong because you're wrong, right? Right? You know, you know what I'm talking about. So when I teach, I'm very clear, maybe overly communicative that because, because I want to be explicitly clear with a client that they're allowed to make a mistake. It doesn't mean you're bad, right? Because when we're working with an instructor, a teacher, a coach, or mentor, it's super vulnerable. And especially when it's with regards to your body, it's your body. And then being met with what feels like criticism when you're, when you're in that vulnerable state. And we definitely get enough of that criticism from ourselves and the media. It's horrible. And your body is not wrong. You are not wrong. And when you're learning something new, you're learning. Yes. Yes. You are, you, the adult, you, the adult, you are still learning things. You heard me. You are learning, which is not a linear thing. It is a vulnerable thing and it's all over the place. If you watched the show, The New Place, which I love and miss all the time and highly recommend, it's a Jeremy Baramy, which is a way that they measure time and it makes no sense. It's so cool. It's so funny. Check it out. Anyway, it's like a real, like learning something is, is kind of a mess. And it, within that confusion as adults, especially, it can be so unmooring that it feels like something is wrong with us. We've become so accustomed to knowing what we're doing and feeling like an expert in the thing we're experts in that it is that much more uncomfortable to not know what is going on. And then when there's confusion or um, things aren't crystal clear, it feels that much more out of control, which sort of spirals, right? So I am 
very conscious of this distinction in my speech with clients, with Everett, and with Jeremy. Jeremy, you're being an asshole, but you're not an asshole. Everett, you are not listening well right now. You're you're not doing you're doing a bad job of listening right now, but you are not a bad listener. Client, you don't remember this brand new movement sequence, not because you're dumb, because it's new and you are learning. And I haven't always put as much thought into this and how it shows up in how I speak to myself. Now, don't get me wrong. I am one of my biggest fans. I celebrate myself and I feel like I have a decent grasp on what my strengths are and also what my weaknesses are. And yet in the valleys between my peak stretches of productivity where I pump out an outrageous amount of content in one go, my internal monologue so easily goes to how unproductive I am, how I don't know what I'm doing, how I don't know what direction I'm moving in, how I'm siphoning off resources from my family that should be used elsewhere, how selfish I am for wanting to build something meaningful and impactful when I should be with my kid 24-7. A whole bunch of ideas and shoulds and criticisms that I do not believe in start flooding my mind. And I say these things to myself as if they are inherent truths. I am unproductive. I am a drain on my family's resources. I am selfish. I if this I say it as if they were inherent truths using the Spanish verb ser. When the reality is that so much of it is estar. I am resting. I am reflecting on what I've done and considering what direction I want to move forward. What is the best next step? My value in my family and in the world is not dependent on how much I put into our checking account every single week at any or at any given time. I am allowed to consider what I want and what I need. I can explore myself outside of motherhood and inside of motherhood. These are all things that I need to do as part of the creative process and the creative cycle. They are all things that I experience and they are not who I am. I can have periods of time where I prioritize my health and needs and that does not make me a selfish person. I can zoom out from my work and assess even if it affects my income and that doesn't make me a grifter. Right? It, that doesn't make me invaluable or worthless. The facts are that I am hardworking. I am driven. I am generous. I am empathetic. I'm creative. I'm funny. I'm energetic. And I am happy. Even when I'm resting and taking a break, taking care of myself, not creating, feeling sad and being quiet. It's a both and situation. And if I'm struggling with something, it doesn't have to define me. If I make a poor decision, it doesn't have to define me. And this is making me think of something that I talk about in my book, Unstuck, From Understudy to the Study of Your Undercarriage, and in past podcast episodes. This idea that I spent a lot of my life playing the role of Alyssa Alter, I'd say that's more of an star vibe versus being Alyssa Alter, which is more of a Sair situation, don't you think? So I, I'd like to invite you now to consider how you're using Sair and a star in La Vida Tuya in your life. How do you speak to others? How do you speak to yourself? Are you accidentally or unconsciously defining yourself by terms that are impermanent, that are transient? Have you ever considered this distinction? And these distinctions that I've made, this specificity, specificity is what allows me to have less conflict with Jeremy, Everett, and everyone in my life. And it's what allows me to advocate for myself because I know exactly what I'm talking about. I know what I'm looking for. Even when I don't know what I'm talking about, I know exactly what I don't know what I'm talking about. (laughs) Does that that even make any sense? Right. I've been 
exercising this specificity, this distinction, this explicit way of communicating. I've been exercising this regularly here on the podcast, in my life, in my home, and with my doctors through this pregnancy, which is uncomplicated in terms of the progression of the pregnancy and my health and the baby's health, but also really complicated because of my past trauma. So I got to and continue to get crystal clear on what's important to me and why so that I can meet my own needs and have my needs met by others who are there to meet my needs, which is, this is why I created your owner's manual. Now, I've been actively updating my owner's manual because I want the latest, most updated edition available to me, Jeremy, and anyone else I choose to share it with in order to support me through this transition to motherhood for the second time. Now, if you don't know what your owner's manual is, you can... Check out my website, AlyssaAlter.com. If you scroll down a little bit, it's right there on the homepage with a really funny picture of me holding um, a carton of oat milk while eating cheese. It's hilarious. Anyway, you can (laughs) check it out there or listen to the podcast episode number 68, which is titled Your Owner's Manual, or at the link in the show notes, which will take you to it on my website. It's an interactive PDF with journal prompts, exercises, things to think about and consider in order to gain a deeper knowledge and understanding of how you operate and what you need to maintain the longevity and integrity of you, just like how you get a manual for a new car or a new appliance. But this one is for you because you're not going to be able to communicate clearly about something if you don't know what the fuck you're talking about right? It's making me think back to like my early Spanish classes where none of us understood Sarah and Astar and we're throwing them all over the place. It gets really confusing, right? And I mean, listen, I know we get it. We see politicians all day, every day (laughs) who are not communicating clearly about things that they don't understand. But look at what a mess that is. And I want more for you. You deserve more than that. Okay. So check out your owner's manual and consider for yourself, how are you using Sarah and a star? How are you speaking to yourself, to those around you? How does this show up in your life? Thank you for sticking with me until the very end of this episode. And trust me when I say that you are amazing. And I mean that in both the Ser and Estar ways. As always, I've got your back, I've got your front, and I've got your undercarriage. Thank you so much for sharing your precious time with me. I am so happy that you're here. I hope this episode resonated with you and maybe even inspired some insight into the myth of motherhood and how that shows up for you in your life. If you found yourself nodding your head along with this episode thinking, oh my God, did Alyssa read my journal? Or I feel so seen. Or even I'll have what she's having. You can. Check out our incredible community over in the private Facebook group Moms Club and visit me at alyssa-alter.com to download your free guide to the 20 things no one tells you about pregnancy and postpartum. Remember, There is no one right way to be a mother. There is only your right way. See you next week.